Hey, look at that! <laughs> All right. In earlier videos, we got this PET 4032 cleaned up and we restored the power supply and keyboard. The next and hopefully final step is to restore the main board to life. And this looks like it may be easier said than done. What was I thinking? Huh, well, I'm here now, so let's get to it. I mentioned in earlier videos that the main board got a bath in the ultrasonic cleaner. You can see how bad it was before it was cleaned. Now we can better see what we have to work with. There's a ton of rust and several areas of the board show signs of earlier work. Before we apply power to the board, I want to take care of a couple issues. These sockets are nasty. And some ICs had their legs literally fall off from the rust when they were removed. So the sockets all have to go. I was able to get the first one off whole, but it took a bit of doing, so I decided to go ahead and cut them all up and remove them in pieces. Lots and lots of pieces. It also seems like a good time to replace the electrolytic capacitors because the legs are rusty, which can easily lead to leaking electrolyte, although I don't see any signs of it. I'm gonna replace the large cap with a modern smaller cap representing the recapping of the board because we don't need the video the entire board being recapped. It smelt something a little fishy when I took that out. As you can see, it's just starting to leak. Conveniently, this board is set up to allow for axial or radial caps, which made a couple substitutions simple and good looking. Funny how uh, porous these boards are. Makes it hard to clean them. Thought I'd ordered one of those, but I hadn't. I ordered one of those. So, I just ordered one of those. And who knows when it'll get here. So, poopy! Those will have to be drilled out, but I'm waiting until the parts are here before I go and drill something out that might work, as ugly as it is. But it's a good thing I waited because the part turned out to be counterfeit. I did replace the TO220 negative 5 volt regulator though. Before soldering on the replacement sockets, I thought it'd probably be a good idea to tone out the traces that'll be under them. And everything looks good. This board is really corroded on the top side, so all the pads had to be scraped, then get a good amount of flux to ensure the solder would flow through better. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> five 40 pin sockets. That's 200 freaking solder connections, plus another 96 since I decided to also replace the four ROM sockets at the same time. Believe me, I had to take several breaks while doing this because of my own aching joints. Once the sockets were taped in place, each was tacked down with two opposing pins. Then, after making sure they were seated properly, it's time to solder them down. All right, I'm gonna plug it in the transformer. And now, the moment of truth. Yeah, will it work? I'm hooked up to the five volts. Let's see. Maybe you can see that that way. So let's see what happens, and I'm ready to kill the power if I have to. Do not have voltage. At first, it looked like there was no power, but in actuality, I was finding that the ripple voltage was looking good. Yeah. I had my meter set to AC instead of DC, so let's try that again. There's my 5 volts. There's my 12 volts. And over here, there's my negative 5 volts. Awesome. The voltages are actually looking great. Let's move on to the next step. All right, so this rusty old regulator's working. I've got one on order. You know, I have some chips warm and some chips cold, but obviously nothing's going to happen until these get populated. So the next thing I always check is a reset circuit. 
and I don't like that. So when I turn it on, it should be held low for a little bit before it goes high, and it may be hard for you to tell, but hopefully you can hear the click. So it's immediately going high when I turn it on. First I found that the Tantalum Cap C51 had a broken leg that was just, it was just kind of standing there with uh, its leg in the air. So I, uh, I scraped it up good, bent it over, and got it soldered down so uh, it'll work for a while. I also checked to make sure it wasn't shorted and that somebody hadn't cut it. Um, went ahead and tried again, and I'm still not getting a reset. So looking at the schematic, there's C49, 50, and 51 are part of this reset circuit along with the 555 timer. And what I found is that C50 also had a broken leg down in the hole. This thing's just got so much corrosion. I'm going to have to replace a lot of these passives, I think. So now let's see what we get. There we go. Now let's see you do it one more time, see if you can hear it. It's actually a little longer than the C64. Next, I like to check the clock. This clock waveform looked terrible to me with a one and a half volt swing to the negative, but I was assured this is normal in a pet. I guess I'm just used to slightly newer old stuff. While I was poking about with the scope, I measured the signals on the address bus and was not happy with the results. Once again, I was informed that it's normal for the pet to have indeterminate voltages on the bus during parts of the cycle when it's not being used. This means that just poking around like it's a Commodore 64 is of limited value. Things are coming along nicely, if not slowly. I'm getting to the point where I actually need to try to run some code. It seemed to me that the logical place to start was by installing a ROMulator, but mine was a kit, still unopened in the bag. So I took a short side quest to assemble it. Once the ROMulator was assembled, it's time to reinstall the 540 pin ICs. The three I.O. chips and the 6502 were replaced. I didn't have a replacement CRT controller or CRTC, so the old one will have to do for now. Uh, finally, the Romulator installs in the socket for the 6502 processor and the replacement 6502 installs into the Romulator. I also installed the character ROM and the smaller socketed glue logic chips that were missing. Now we're ready for some testing. Uh, the first test I performed is a no-op test on the address bus. With the Romulator set to act as a NOP generator, we can check each line in the address bus from least significant to most significant, and if everything's working properly, we should have each line in the sequence be half the frequency of the prior one. Let me interject here real quick to explain what a NOP generator is. A processor like the 6502 keeps track of where it's working at in memory with an internal memory called the program counter. Each time the processor needs to perform the next instruction, it uses the address bus to request the next one from memory. It then retrieves the instruction from the data bus and determines what to do next. In the case of the NOP instruction, the processor does nothing except increase the program counter by one and fetch the next instruction. This is normally used for tight timing since each NOP takes exactly two clock cycles, or to comment out another instruction in memory by making it do nothing. In this case, the Romulator has the data bus hardwired to the NOP instruction, so the processor continuously reads it, increases the address bus by one, and repeats forever. We can then look at the address bus lines with a scope, and if each line is half the frequency of the prior one, we know that things are in pretty good shape. We're not eliminating every possible issue, but it's a good start. In this case, I'm very pleasantly surprised to see the address bus actually looks good. While we're at it, we can also check the chip select lines to see if the ROM and RAM are being accessed. And they are. Encouraged by the surprisingly great results, I set the Romulator to emulate a basic 4 PET with 32K of RAM and a CRTC chip which is exactly what this one is. So this means it's gonna use the ROM and RAM in the Romulator instead of the real stuff. So unless they're interfering with the pet in other ways, it should work even if they're bad. Keep in mind, I'm still working blind at this point because the CRT chassis is still being refinished and there's no screen attached. And turning it on, I heard. 
Wow, is this thing actually working? So before I hook up the CRT, I gotta make sure that the main board is putting out proper horizontal and vertical drive signals. If they're not present, it can damage the machine. To check this, I changed the ROM emulator to the pet tester mode. Pet tester is a diagnostic ROM made by David Roberts that lets you test a pet that has limited functionality. With the pet tester installed, I turned the machine on and I found absolutely nothing on either drive signal. They're both dead. And since I can't hook up the VDU board and the CRT until these are working, that's going to be my priority. So I started by swapping out the 7486 because it's part of this circuit. It's really ugly and rusty and it's in a socket. Sadly, that easy fix was not to be. I added a reset button by connecting it across a cap in the reset circuit that was replaced earlier. This allows us to reset the PET without powering it off and on continuously. With that in place, I checked the chips at UC8, 9, and 10 and found that some of the signals were in an illegal state, 1.5 volts. Since it's unlikely, but not impossible, that all three chips have failed, I suspect the CRTC is bad. But I wanted confirmation before I ordered what I thought was going to be a really expensive chip. I was really grateful that Dave, the creator of the Pet Tester ROM, suggested on the VCF forums that if I trigger the scope on the rising edge of the reset signal, then look at the chip select line on the CRTC along with data line 0, I should see activity on the CRTC. It should be selected 18 times. I'd been looking for an excuse to learn this newfangled digital oscilloscope I bought a couple years ago, so this seems to be a good opportunity. I complain a lot about this scope, but I shouldn't, because there's nothing wrong with it. It's actually a good scope. I just learned to use my Tektronics in the 80s, and I'm used to having switches and dials right on the front to do what I want, not having to go into a bunch of menus. It took me a couple hours to work out how to set the scope up, but by the time I was done, I was feeling at least a little more comfortable with the digital way of doing things and was excited to find that there were indeed exactly 18 pulses on the chip select line of the CRTC. Sweet! Okay, bittersweet, because it looks like the 6545 CRTC chip is bad, and at the time they were pretty expensive at about $25 a pop. Once I ordered two of them with shipping, it'd be about 60 bucks. And I always order two of vintage chips because they have a high failure rate and are often DOA. Fortunately, before I ordered, someone pointed out that the 6845 CRTC, which is for the BBC Micro, is compatible with the PET. I was able to order them for about $6 each coming from across the pond. I ended up spending half the amount and have several spares on hand, but they took several weeks to arrive. Here we are again, waiting and waiting. While well, waiting for the CRTC to arrive, it seemed a good time to restore the VDU board and get it installed into the chassis. The VDU board had the rusty drive transistor replaced and was thoroughly cleaned with alcohol and brushes. It went back into the chassis and awaited the arrival of the replacement CRTC. Finally, the new chips arrived and one was installed in the board. The Romulator's off. Pull out the CRTC. I bought some at Retro Clinic. And these are the BBC Micro CRTCs, but they're compatible with the PET. And they're $6 each. So, if you're wondering why I bought three, because I usually buy two, but by buying three, at least three chips was about the same as the shipping, instead of the shipping being more than the product. And that gives me a couple of spares. There we go. A quick check, and it looks like the horizontal and vertical sync signals are now present. Time to hook it up. Once the main board was returned to the chassis, it's time for yet another moment of truth. Yeah, another one. Okay, got a heater again. Still don't have voltage. No static. Dang, nothing at all. The heater's on in the neck, so it's getting power. After a bit of research and poking around, I found that two of the three fusible resistors on the board were open circuit. So I replaced them, but still had no image. You know, in situations like this, I like to start by getting back to the basics and eliminate anything I can from the test. 
The only things that were different from when it was working are that the VDU board and the keyboard are connected. So I did a bunch of testing. I didn't have any horizontal or vertical video sweep. And after playing around, I discovered that if I unplug the keyboard, I do. So let's see what happens. In three, two, one. I heard some voltages. Hey, look at that! <laughs> All right. I mean, you know, clearly there's no, something not right, but we've got a video signal. Look at that. Oh my God. That's so awesome. Woohoo. And finally, I have text on the screen. It's total garbage, but it's beautiful, beautiful garbage. Yes. Oh, that looks awesome. I mean, the text works, it, it's, it's doing something. So I'm about six months into this pet and there's still a ways to go. I've got quite a bit more done on this board, but I'm gonna cut it at this point because I've still got some repairs to do and I don't wanna wait till December to get it to you. So as soon as it's ready, it'll be right here. And in the meantime, check out this video where I fixed the Commodore 64 with about a dozen bad ICs. Uh, yeah, the pet's gonna beat that. Thanks for coming.